tonight. Our host is Christopher. Um, they're a student currently at Boston University, um, majoring in both voice performance and Japanese, and their wish is to bridge study his studies together to explore and spread Japanese music and culture throughout the world, which is what he'll be doing tonight for us. Um, he was a student of the Kyoto Consortium for Japanese Studies at Doshisha University during the months of June and July this past summer, and he's going to be sharing with us tonight a little bit about some of the things he experienced. So I'll pass it off to Chris. Thank you very much. Yeah, hello everyone. It's very nice to see you all. My name is Chris and I'm the special events associate here at the Japan Society. Um, and I'm very excited to talk to you about Gion Matsuri, truly Japan's most beloved festival and definitely one of the largest. Um, it brings in literally millions of people every year from around the world to see it so much so that sometimes the people of Kyoto joke around and say oh the best time to leave Kyoto is during Gion Matsuri because there's so many people everywhere but it's a really festive time and I'm really excited to share it with you all and share my experience so let me just share my screen real quick Gion Matsuri um a little bit about the history and whatnot of the festival. So this festival actually dates back to the ninth century. Specifically, it originated in the year 869. This was a year that was quite eventful for Japan. There was a massive earthquake in the north and tsunami. And there was also a huge plague that um, ravaged the city of Kyoto. And in order to combat this, the emperor uh, basically ordered Yasaka Shrine, which at the time was known as Gion Shrine, to erect 66 hoko, which are giant floats with spears on them, um, to combat this plague. Be 66, because there was one for each of the provinces in Japan at the time. And also they asked Yasaka Shrine to do this because Yasaka Shrine is said to be the home of the god Susano, who is the brother of the sun goddess Amaterasu and along with being the patron god of storms and the seas is also said to have magical abilities to combat plague. So they had this giant um, festival and the plague went away. And it, in the next hundred years, they did it every so often, but it wasn't very regular until the year 970 when they decided that they were going to host Gion Matsuri every year. And they have done so ever since. There is really only one period of time that interrupted the annual festivities. And this was in the latter half of the 15th century due to constant war. And, and then there was also a very tiny brief period of struggle during the pandemic, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But basically beyond that, it has had an uninterrupted observance history. And it is really considered the most beloved and definitely the largest festival in Japan. It lasts an entire month from July 1st to July 30th, 31st. And it's something that the entire city really looks forward to the whole year. And this is a picture of Yasaka Shrine that I took. Most of everything that you're going to see is pictures and videos that I took during my time there. Um, and this is actually Yasaka Shrine. It's not too crowded at this moment, but it's still very popular the whole year round. So just a little bit of a timeline of events. We start one of the biggest, the, one of the first big events that happens is July 2nd, which is the Kuji Tori Shiki. And the Kuji Tori Shiki is basically this ceremony only for representatives of the floats that are going to be made and the participants of the festival. And they gather together to draw lots to see what the order of the floats is going to be. And what that means is there are two parts of the festival, the Saki Matsuri or the former part of the festival and then the Ato Matsuri or the latter part of the festival. And each fe the crowning part of each festival is the Yamaboko Junko, which is this giant procession of the floats. Now they make 33 floats in total, 23 uh, yama and 10 hoko. And there are there is a yamaboko junko for each, the, both the Saki Matsuri and the Ato Matsuri. The Saki Matsuri yamaboko junko is on the 17th. 
the Atomatsuri Yamaboko Jungo is on the 24th. And they draw lots to see what the order is going to be for the um, procession of the floats, because it's different every year, save for the Naginata Boko, which is one of the most famous and more special floats, is always at the beginning of the procession on the 17th. So that's that. Then on July 10th is the Omukai Chochin, which is basically a time when shrine parishioners bring lanterns and they have celebrations and performances at Yasaka Shrine to pay respects to the gods and kind of usher in this festival season. There are a lot of performances by children at this time as well. And it's really something for the community to enjoy. From the 10th to the 14th is a period of time called the Hoko Tate or the Yama Tate. There are two kinds of floats, which I'll talk a little bit about later, the Hoko and the Yama. And at this point, they're building all of the floats and they build them along the Shijo area in just on the side of the road for everyone to see because it's quite the spectacle. And it takes them multiple days to build, but there's lots of people who are building it at the time and they play, they practice some of the music during this time as well that is played. On July 13th is the Chigo visiting the shrine. The Chigo are sacred page boys, which I'll talk about more later, but they are a vital part of the traditions and the festivities. Then there are two periods, one for each festival, the Saki Matsuri and the Ato Matsuri of the first is July 14th through the 16th, and the second is July 21st through the 23rd. And these are the three nights leading up to the big procession, the big Yama Boko Junko. And they are respectively the Yo 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 Yama, the Yo Yo Yama, and then the Yo Yama. And they're basically big night street parties. So they close off the streets. People can walk around amongst the floats. They can actually enter some of the floats. There's a lot of music being played. There's lots of street food. There's games. And it's a really lively time. It's also a very, it's, it's very crowded during it. So you have to be a little careful of like the heat and whatnot because Kyoto is notoriously very hot during the summer, but it's very lively and it's a lot of fun. For the Saki Matsuri on July 14th through the 16th, there is an interesting event called the Byobu Matsuri, which is when a lot of the older homes along the parade route in central Kyoto open their doors to the public and display some of their most prized treasures that have been passed down from generation to generation. And the crowning um, treasures of this group are the beautiful screens that they have on display. So members of the public go in and, and view them and it's quite fun. Um, one of my personal favorites is on July 16th is the Iwami Kagura performance. So Kagura is this very ancient form of like dance theater that is entirely rooted in Shintoism and is primarily a form of dance theater that is for the entertainment of the gods and they often tell stories from mythology. Nowadays, there are actually non-religious groups of Kagura performers that just, they write their own plays and they perform. It's always rooted in traditional culture though. And in the Iwami Kagura performance, there is a very famous troupe from Shimane Prefecture in the West from Izumo called Iwami Kagura. And they come to the shrine, uh, to Yasaka Shrine to give their performance. And it's quite fun. And it was actually, especially, I got to see it and it was especially cool for me because while I was in Japan, I actually went to Izumo and Shimane Prefecture. So it was really cool to have that connection. Um, July 17th and the 24th, like I said, is the Yamaboko Junko. That happens in the morning for a couple hours. And then in the afternoon, evening, is the procession of the Mikoshi. The Mikoshi are basically much smaller portable shrines. And I say much smaller in comparison to the big main buildings of Yasaka Shrine, but they are still quite large. And they are carried on big wooden planks on the shoulders of teams of men. And they are paraded, zigzagged throughout central Kyoto. And um, there's a lot of hoopla and you know shouting and whatnot and it's a lot of fun and they also shake the mikoshi to entertain the gods inside because it's believed that the gods enter the mikoshi so that they can then enter there and then the mikoshi are taken from yasaka shrine to a holding area on shijo dori shijo street and 
they are held there for the duration of the festival, basically until the 24th, when they are brought back to Yasaka Shrine. And when they are going to each destination, they're shake, they're, you know, the, the, sorry, the men that are carrying them, shake them around to entertain the gods inside. Then we have on July 24th is the Hanagasa Junko. The Hanagasa Junko is literally the flower umbrella parade. And it's basically a parade of entertainers and the children performers and whatnot who parade on the same route as the Yamaboko Junko. And they give performances later on at the main stage in the courtyard of Yasaka Shrine. This includes not just the children performers, but also geisha and apprentice geisha called Maiko and also lion dances and drumming and there's shrine maiden performances. It's really very fun. And then finally, the last major event is on July 30th, which is the purification at Eki Shrine where all of the representatives of the floats and the practitioner or the participants of the festival go and be purified. And then afterwards it's open to the public for public purification. So I, this is my first video and it's just rather short and I, it's depicting the Yoyama nights. Normally they close off the streets, like I mentioned earlier, this video is going to have cars in them. So this is one of the streets that wasn't closed off, but normally they're closed off and you can mill about the floats and whatnot. You're still going to see a lot of people on the sidewalks. I also want to draw your attention. This is a Hoko float. I'll talk a little bit more about them later. But if you see on the top here, um, in, in between the two sets of hanging lanterns, you see it's it's kind of hard to see. But these are the musicians. They sit on the top compartment on the edge and they just are constantly playing music, which I'll talk again a little bit about later. Um, but this is one of the videos, so prepare yourselves for the sound. <laughs> Nice and short, but that's one of the videos. Oh, sorry. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about the floats. There are two kinds of floats, like I said, the yama, which is this picture on the left, and the hoko, which is this picture on the right. The yama are called yama because that word in Japanese means mountain, and these floats are constructed to look somewhat like mountains, at least on the top. They depict various scenes from Chinese and Japanese history and mythology, and they are carried around by smaller teams of men on their shoulders. And I do, I, I keep on saying men because Gion Matsuri is said to be the fest, like a festival for men because only men are allowed to participate on religious grounds. But um, so those are the yama. And then on my right here is the hoko. And the hoko are what I'm going to talk a little bit more about because they're the more quintessential symbol of the festival. So the hoko can be up to 25 meters tall or around like 82-ish feet. Um, and they can weigh up to 12 tons. So they are very large and very heavy. And it takes literally the teams and teams of people, of men to pull them. And it, they don't move very fast because they are so large. But the hoko are made primarily of pine wood and they are made in the traditional style so this means that there's no nails at all in the building of these floats. They use instead a traditional hemp rope and each hoko float uses up to three miles of rope. So a lot of rope. And they use a large needle to thread the rope and to knot it together when they're making the floats. The wheels that they use, there are four of them on the bottom. You can't really see them in this picture, but there are four big wheels and each wheel is six feet in diameter and although they construct new floats every year they do not construct new wheels every year because once a wheel is constructed it can last anywhere between 50 and 100 years before it needs to be replaced so they don't always build the wheels um, and then when they are building the floats they actually use hot water 
that they pour on the wood to allow it to expand to then lock into place. Um, yes. Some of the floats are constructed in very narrow streets. And so there's one day towards the end of the construction period where they have a test run. And this is the only time where members of the public are actually allowed to try pulling the ropes and moving the floats. But in some of these very narrow streets, they have a lot of men sitting on top of the floats on the little roof to like push the wires away so that they don't get all tangled up, which is quite the sight to see. And you can see there's still some in this photo on the top during the main Yamaboko Junko procession. Um, in terms of their outer decoration, a lot of the decor dates back to the Edo period because this is a time when the merchants started getting really involved in the festivals and they used the floats because a lot of these floats ended up being owned by like merchant groups or or they had a lot of merchants that were associated with the area where the float is from in Kyoto and so the merchants would use this as an opportunity to like showcase their riches and make themselves look better than all of their competitors and so interestingly they would get really rare and exotic uh, treasures from the Silk Road which were from places such as China, Persia, Korea, and even European countries such as Holland and France. And so some of these floats, you can see these beautiful, almost Flemish looking European tapestries on them as well, which look very out of place from a, a Westerner perspective with all of the Japanese um, art and visuals around it. But it's quite striking and it's really an interesting piece of history. Um, and the floats, from what I could tell, the floats don't actually really change their, they're, they're made every year, so they are new, but the arts and the treasures that are used on them remain the same because each float has its own character. So yes, and that's this. So then I have two videos. One is of the yama being pulled and one is of the hoko. And this is, I was positioned when I took these videos during the yama boko junko at a corner so they have to turn. So the yama are really easy to turn because it's just on the shoulders of people, but the hoko are very difficult to turn. And so what you'll, well, you can't really see it here, but they put in big bamboo slats underneath the wheels and then pour lots of water on them to make them slippery. And then all of the teams have to pull the ropes at an angle to then shift the whole float. And it's very nerve wracking in the beginning. And then after you get used to it, you're like, yeah, turn it, turn it. And so some of the early videos I took, you can hear everyone go, oh, and they finally turn because it's very impressive because they're so tall. But here's the Yama. That one is rather straightforward. This is the one that I would like to show you more though. This is the hoko. So the first time that happened, everyone was like, oh my God, but that was one of the last floats. So we were like used to it by now, but it's very exciting. Okay, so now we talk about arguably one of the most vital parts of the festival, and this is the Chigo or the Sacred Page Boys. So back in the day, there would be a Sacred Chigo, a Chigo, a Sacred Page Boy for every single float, but now there's only a handful and only one of them really rides in the float. And this is the sacred chigo for the Naginata Boko, the first float in the procession. But they still pick a handful and the chigo are, the, the word chigo literally refers to the immaturity of the boys, thus reflecting their purity and the chigo are said to almost be like vessels of the deities during the 
um, festival period. And so because of that, at least the Naginata Boko Chigo, if not all of the Chigo, are not allowed to touch the ground because they are not allowed to be sullied by the earth or whatnot during this period. And I also just wanted to take a moment to recognize this bottom left photo that you see here of all of the Chigo sitting in a row. This was provided through our member, David Rosie, who's here today, by Kawasaki Moto, a member of Kyoto, whose his family has been in Kyoto for several uh, generations. Kawasaki Moto is the eighth generation Raku Yaki potter in his family, which has been making Raku pottery bowls since the late Edo period, so around the 1830s-ish. And his family was lucky enough to have their son Takahiro be chosen as one of the Chigo which is a huge honor for old Kyoto families like his. And I'll talk a little bit more about the requirements that are that go into the selection of Chigo later, but I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so this is a picture of the Mikoshi or the portable shrines that become the temporary home of the gods. There are three. When they are pre uh, sorry, processed through so the central part of the city, they actually each take their own route. So it's interesting when I was first for the July 17th procession, when they're leaving Yasaka Shrine and going to Shijo, when I was watching them leave after they left the shrine, I tried going home and then I couldn't really go home because every time I got to another street, there would be a Mikoshi passing through and everything would be stopped. And then you would cross there and then there'd be another Mikoshi. So it's really lively and it's a lot of fun. But it can be a little frustrating when you're trying to navigate the city and they're, oh, there's another Mikoshi. But you can see they're quite beautiful. They're quite ornate. Each one has a golden phoenix atop of it. And they really are quite impressive. And you can see uh, in the videos that I'm about to show you that although they are smaller portable shrines, they are still definitely quite large. So this first video, I'm going to cut about three quarters of the way through is of the Saki Matsuri, where they are weaving through the city going to Shijo. So I'll show this one now. Cut. So you can see they're kind of jumping up and down with the Mikoshi, and that is to entertain the god that is residing or the gods that are residing within. And then the second video is from the Atomatsuri. So on the 24th, when they are leaving their temporary home in Shijo to go back to Yasaka Shrine. And this is the third of the Mikoshi to leave. And this one was interesting because they actually kept on processing it in a circle in front of the building before they finally left. So, and it was very lively and we were, and the, we in the audience on the sidelines were actually getting pushed off of the road because there were just so many people who were there. So a couple of things before I move on. In their temporary holding spot, there are two miniature shrines on either side. And before they are processed away back to Yasaka Shrine, they are put in front of one of those shrines and they have a little ceremony there as well. And everyone sits on the ground and they pray. And um, it's quite a moving scene. The other thing is you might have noticed in that video, there was a bunch of like plants on top of the uh, 
sorry, on top of the phoenix, on the top of the mikoshi. These are rice plants, and they are used to signify or to represent how all of these festivals do end up having their roots in the ancient like harvest traditions. And so that is the purpose of that. Uh, next, I can move on. Oh, yes. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about the music of Gion Matsuri. So the music is officially called Gion Bayashi, but the people of Kyoto call it Konchikichin because that's what it sounds like. And the Bayashi is, or the Ohayashi is the name of the group of instrumentalists. And it's very simple. It's just drums or taiko kata, uh, flutes, fue kata, and then gongs or kane kata. And this picture and this video are from the Yoyama Knights. They set up and they practice outside uh, just for the enjoyment of the public. And I just want to, you've already kind of heard the music, but I wanted to play it again because I think it's very cool and it's a very ancient sound as well. So that was the music. It's really distinct sounding. It's very cool. And actually, you might think it's very, because it's very old, you might think, oh, it's just passed down from ear. But there is actually a notation system. And this is the music geek in me because I study music as well as Japanese. But there is actually a notation system. And the notation system is really interesting because it is squares, or not squares, not squares, sorry, triangles and circles and they're connected by lines. And then there, some of the emphatic shouting that you hear is actually written down um, in katakana in the score. All right, next. Oh, is some performance highlights. So there are tons of performances that happen during Gion Matsuri. There's lots of geisha performances, there's shrine maiden performances, there's all kinds of different music performances, but these are two that I really liked, so I wanted to highlight them. The first one on my left here is a women's group who are performing on a rare Japanese instrument called the Yakumogoto, which I have done a little bit of research into traditional Japanese music and I had never heard of it. So of course I looked it up and tried learning everything I possibly could about it. And it's a very interesting instrument. It is a piece of wood with only a few strings stretched across the length of it. And when you play it, you pluck with one of your hands. And then on the other hand, there is actually a cylinder that you wear on one of your fingers that you press down on the string and then slide it up and down the length to change the pitch. It is similar for any of you who are familiar with Chinese music. It is similar to a Chinese instrument that I'm going to but butcher the pronunciation of, but it is called the guqin or the qin which was used in medieval Japan often and was referred to in Japanese as the kin. Um, so I'll play a little bit of this. This one is kind of soft, so it shouldn't hurt your ears. <laughs> That's a little taste of that. This one on my right here is actually a clip from the Iwami Kagura performance. So they ended up performing, both of these are actually at the exact same um, venue. This is the no stage inside Yasaka Shrine. And you can see in this, or you will see in this video with the Kagura that they really change up the 
look of it to fit the purpose of Kagura. There's lots of hanging tapestries and whatnot in the background to create a backstage and whatnot. And the Kagura performance had multiple sets. So they performed multiple different plays. Each play was about 15 to 20, sometimes even half an hour. And this was the last, the beginning of the last performance, which tells the story of Susano, the god, and his battle against the eight-headed dragon, the Yamato no Orochi. And in this story, Susano goes down to the Izumo region of Japan after being expelled from the heavens and meets an old couple with their beautiful young daughter and they are terribly sad and Susano asks why. And the old couple reveals that they used to have eight daughters, but they have been had to sacrifice a daughter each year to this awful eight-headed dragon. And they're very sad because they're down to their last daughter and she is about to be sacrificed. So Susano says, well, if you let me marry her, then I'll deal with the dragon for you. And they said, well, sure. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. So Susano tricks the dragon and slays him. And this is the story that this play tells. So I'm going to play a little bit of this one. I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, but you'll be able to see that Kagura is an incredibly lively form of theater. And it has very loud music. So I'm going to ask you to prepare your ears again, because I don't know how loud this video is going to be. I apologize. But this is the beginning where one of the other daughters gets eaten by one of the heads of the dragon. So that is a little taste of Kagura. Um, if you're interested, there are lots of videos on YouTube of other Kagura performances. And I think you can even find um, this play being performed by Iwami Kagura. Um, I highly recommend looking it up. It's super cool. But that is that. Right, so to end, I wanted to do a special highlight of someone who has a really interesting relationship with the Gion Matsuri, and this is Hata Shacho, or President Hata of Shoedo. Shoedo is an incense company based in Kyoto that has hundreds of years of history, and they provide all of the incense to like all of the temples in the city. And they have several um, locations across Japan. They even have one, I believe, in Colorado. So if any of you are in Colorado, you can go check that out. Um, and we've done an event with them in the past and we, we have a relationship with the company and we always enjoy working with them and talking with them. So President Hata has a very interesting relationship with the festival and loves the festival so much. He actually worked with Boston people and brought 20 Gion Bayashi performers to Boston in um, to celebrate the 55th anniversary of the Boston Kyoto sister city relationship in 2014, I believe that was. So I had the immense honor of being able to interview him. So I want to share some of his story and some of what I asked and some of what he answered. So he was actually chosen to be the Naginata Boko Chigo sacred page boy 
1964, which is the same year, incidentally, as the Tokyo Olympics. So it was a really big year for Japan. And I asked him about this and he said that this was very interesting because he is not actually affiliated with Yasaka Shrine because in Japan, um, some of you probably already know this, but in Japan, each family has its own shrine that it is, or not its own shrine, but it has the, their shrine that they are associated with. And the par parishioners who are associated with a certain shrine are called Ujiko. So Hata Shacho and his family are not actually Ujiko of Yasaka Shrine. And so when his parents were first notified that the, the people of Gion Matsuri wanted to choose uh, Hata Shacho to be the Chigo, at first they declined because they were like, we are not Ujiko, this is not really our position to do so. But it was actually his grandparents who convinced his parents to take them up on this offer for various reasons. One of which is the fact that there are so many very specific rules that go into the choosing of a Chigo. So if you are meeting all of those rules, then it's a great honor. And what, you know, some of the rules are the child has to be quite healthy. Everybody in the family has to be healthy. There cannot have been a death in the family for the past year. And there's lots of very specific rules like that. And the other thing that they mentioned that the grandparents mentioned was that since there's only one Chigo chosen to be in the Naginata Boko every year, in 100 years, that's only 100 children out of the whole population. So you really should do this because it was a great honor. And so they ended up accepting and Hatashacho was the Chigo for Naginata Boko. Um, I asked him what Shoedo does in preparation for the festival in their store, if they do anything. And he said that they change the decorations inside the store and they also give out Chimaki. Chimaki are lucky charms that exist all over Japan, but the ones for Gion Matsuri are rather special. They are made of dried bamboo and they are used as evil, or sorry, they're used as lucky charms to ward off evil spirits for the whole year. And so they give those out to their customers. But beyond that, they don't really do too much more in celebration because they are not affiliated with the shrine. And he gave an example of how down the street from their headquarters, there was a soba shop that was a part of the shrine. So they do big celebrations. They have big lanterns and everything in front of their um, establishment, and they can really celebrate very loudly, but because Shoedo is not an Ujiko company, they can't fully celebrate. Um, it's not really their place. So there is that. And then I also asked him how he and the people of Kyoto felt about foreigners getting involved with the festival, because while I was in Japan these past two months, I actually, and not only did I see some, you know, white people, for example, in the festival, I also had a friend in my study abroad program from North Carolina, who was a part of the Ato Matsuri, and the, he was affiliated with the procession of the Mikoshi. So I asked, you know, why, how do you feel about that? And he was saying that he really loves that foreigners are so interested in the Gion Matsuri and he felt that it was almost like the goen, the destiny of the festival, in a sense, and, you know, just linking all of these people together in a globalized community. Um, but he also said that, though he's really, really glad that foreigners are coming and experiencing the festival, he really hopes that they don't just see the surface, they also understand just how much preparation and how much work goes into it, especially behind the scenes. And so he actually thought it was very cool to have foreigners actually participating in the festival because they can really understand all of the work that goes into the making of it. Um, I also asked him what the festival looked like during the pandemic. And he was saying that the first year of the pandemic, they couldn't do absolutely anything because of everything being shut down. But they really made an effort the second year to do something for two reasons. One, to keep the festival spirit alive and to not forget the purpose of it. 
But another reason was because there are certain traditions in the festival that have to be kept alive. And the only way that they are kept alive is by passing the knowledge down through generation while you're doing it. For example, the building of the big hoko floats, that happens every year and there every year the older generation teaches the younger generation how to do it by doing it and so when you have a couple years off every year older members retire and so if you don't have it to every year it's very difficult to pass on that information and so in order to keep the tradition alive they at least made the floats the second year and then representatives from those floats went to yasaka shrine to pray to try and keep the spirit alive and then um, there was no audience or anything, but they were really trying to do as much as they could with the restrictions that they had. And then finally, I asked him, you know, what his favorite part of the festival was. And he started talking about how he really liked how it was very communal in a sense. There is over two thousand, like 2,000 to 3,000 people who come together to put this festival on. And he was joking by saying, you know, his role in the festival is very easy because he just plays the flute. He is a fuekata in the Naginata Boko. So his job isn't that difficult, but there's other people who have very difficult jobs, almost dangerous jobs. Some people who are sitting on the roof of the hoko during the procession, for example. And there's so much hard work that goes on behind the scenes that he's very appreciative of that. And he loves seeing how much work and how much devotion goes into the festival and the camaraderie while at the same time he also liked seeing some of the rivalry between each float because each float wants to try and outdo each other and it kind of shows that team's pride that they're coming together to make something so he really enjoyed that aspect of it um so that's pretty much everything that i have in my presentation so i don't know if you want to move on to questions now how we I don't know what the format is to do that so I'll be voicing any questions that come into the chat and we'll be answering them in the order they come in so please um feel free to start entering those uh we're going to be starting with our first one which may be a restatement but um Iris or Iris excuse me was wondering um do you need to be part of a special group to be part of the people carrying the shrine um, I believe that question is talking about the Mikoshi, the portable shrines. And if that is the case, yes, I, um, if memory serves me correctly, you have to be an Ujiko, you have to be a member of the shrine itself in order, like a shrine parishioner. And you also have to be a man. You cannot be a woman on grounds of religious purposes that I don't fully understand, but you it is not proper for women to do it. It has to be a man for the, you know, worship of the gods or whatnot. But it is people who are ujiko of the shrine. You have to belong to the shrine in order to do that. Messin um, asks, what do they do with the floats after the festival is over every year? That's a very good question. They just dismantle them and they make them anew next year. So unfortunately you don't really see them on display. Although, um, oh, I forget which train station it is, but one of the, or not train station, one of the subway stations has a um, display uh, for Gion Matsuri that they have all year round in celebration of the festival. And they have one of the big old wheels on display with some lanterns. So you can still see parts of the floats around the city every once in a while, but, but the floats themselves get dismantled. Um, Kara asks, how long does the festival last in a day and how many days does it last? Um, well, it lasts for, in terms of how many days, it lasts literally the entire month of July. So every single day in July, there is something related to Gion Matsuri happening. And in terms of hours in the day, it usually starts rather early in the morning and it can end really like Yoyoyama, for example, the, the festival nights leading up to the processions. And you can enjoy those until about 11 p.m. And then the city kind of shuts down. 
So it's really almost the entire length of the day. Stephen and Marsha both ask about if there are any special foods that are unique to Gion Matsuri or any special food traditions connected to the festival. Um, yes, that's a very good question. So the chimaki, this, it's not food, but the chimaki is a tradition that it exists around, but the Gion Matsuri chimaki are very special and they're made in a specific way. Um, in terms of food, not so much. It's just a lot of just Matsuri street food, if you are familiar with that. Um, like yakitori, yakiniku, um, things like that. There's also the shaved ice is very popular, but not anything really specific. Um, I personally would love to see if you have any, um, you know, if you brought any of those uh, special goods over from Japan. Oh, thank you for asking. So uh, <laughs> I've been to Japan twice. Um, I've been lucky enough to have that um, experience. The first time was several years ago at this point, and I exp experienced the Hakata Gion Yamakasa Festival in Fukuoka that um, if you follow us on social media, we just posted about that, um, which is very similar to Gion Matsuri in the sense that it's also a festival that appeared several hundred, if not a thousand years ago in originally to dispel plague and they also make really big floats. So it's similar in that sense. But the reason why I bring this up is because I had, I received an Uchiwa fan, a circular fan um, from that. And so I made it my goal that every festival that I go to, I want to have an Uchiwa fan from. So I have a couple fans um, that they sell, that they have the hoko on them. And this is, the tigo right there. And they usually have a backside as well. Quite beautiful art, um, I think. And here's another one with a view of the, oh, you can't see me anymore. A view of the tigo. Um, and there's the back here. I really like this one with the, the lanterns. And then this is one that I bought um, I got three. This is one that I bought at a convenience store, which is fun because not only does it have the art on the front, but it also has an explanation in the back in Japanese about the different parts of the floats and the yama versus the hoko, which I liked. And then also, this isn't really a good, but in the train stations and the subway stations, they had a lot of free flyers about the festival. So this is one, oh, you can't really see it, can you? Um, this is a guidebook, you can't read, really, okay, let me just, I don't know if I can, no, never mind. I, I won't take the time. And if you open it, sorry, you can only see half of it, but if you open it, there's a map on the inside and they have one for the Saki Matsuri and one for the Ato Matsuri and it tells you the parade route and it also tells you very useful things like where are all the convenience stores located near the parade route just in case you're dying from the heat and you need water like I was. So it's very helpful. Um, and then, yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, this isn't a good from the festival per se, but when I was lucky enough to visit Shimane Prefecture and I went to Izumo, there is a museum there called the Shimane Prefecture Museum of Ancient Izumo. And Izumo is not only where the Iwami Kakura group is from, but it's also just associated with really ancient history and mythology in Japan. And so Kagura itself as an art form is really popular. So I was lucky enough to purchase this book that you can't really see, but it's a book on Kagura that has lots of cool pictures on the inside and information that you can't really see. <laughs> but yeah, and they sell other things. They sell other kinds of fans. They sell, um, arrows, sacred arrows, they sell the omamori, they, there's lots of different things that you can get from that. And a lot of it is available during the Yoyama nights as well. Scarlett asks, is the word chigo possibly related to the word chisai, meaning small? And if so, or what is the exact meaning of chigo, if you know? Um, that's a very good question. Naoko-san will probably be able to answer this better than I will, but I will take a stab at it, which is um, if you just look at the kanji, it's different kanji. So 
Chisai is spelled differently than Chigo. Um, in terms of the the sound, there might be a connection. I'm not actually quite sure. But Chigo itself, the literal definition refers to like immature boy in terms of like like physically immature, which reflects their purity. Um, because everything is about purity for this festival and purification. So Chigo is also the word itself is not specific to Gion Matsuri. Like there were in, in sorry, in the past at temples, there were Chigo, which were like just younger page boys that were there at the temples learning about the trade and whatnot and, and growing up to eventually become monks. But yeah, I don't know if that answers your question at all, but. <laughs> I think Naoko may have uh, dropped a little information about that in the chat. Oh, yes, but, her information um, is very good. <laughs> Irais asks, what is your favorite part of the Kyanwat City? I am so glad you asked. My favorite part, I know exactly what it is, and it's the kanekata, the instrument. So in the um, Gion Bayashi ensemble, you have the drums, the taiko kata, right? The flutes, the fue kata, but then you have the gongs, the kane kata, which are really loud and obnoxious, but I love them because they have a really beautiful sound. And not only that, but when they're on the top of the hoko, they are sitting on the edge of the hoko and their mallets that they use have really colorful, very long ropes that hang off the side. And so when they're playing, they're dancing around on the side of the instrument. And I, I'm not sure if you could see them in my videos, but you can you can see it very clearly when you're there. And it's just so mesmerizing. So that is very specific, but that is definitely my favorite part. Um, do you know by any chance the name of the theater with the dragon performance? Yes, okay, so that is the art style uh, or the, the theater form of Kagura, right? And Iwami Kagura, the troupe, came to Yasaka Shrine to perform that. So that is on the Noel Theater stage located in the shrine. So that stage is specifically reserved for important festival like performances and like performances for that shrine specifically. So there's lots of different, it was the same the other video that I showed of the Yakumogoto, the rare instrument that all the women were playing, was the exact same stage. And it's at the shrine. So, yes. Yuko says, talking about food, I heard that they do not eat cucumbers during this period because the cucumbers cross section looks like the crest of Yasaka Shrine. Oh, That's interesting. something that you heard about. I had not actually heard of that. That's so cool. Thank you. <laughs> No, because nodding. So I think that that is a thing that. Yeah, I no, practice. I definitely, it sounds like a thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So it is 6.59. Um, if there are no further questions, we will be wrapping up this event. Of course, um, please reach out to us um, if you have, you know, questions that come up later or you want further resources about um, information about Gion Matsuri, we'll be happy to share them. Um, as well as the recording of this program will be shared out to all the registrants um, through your email. Uh, we have maybe one final question before we wrap up, but thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. Um, Scarlett says, I've heard of someone with Kagura as their last name. Do you know what Kagura may mean? Um, well, in terms of the... I'm not sure if you can see it on my book, but in terms of the spelling for the art form, oh no, you can't really see it, never mind. In terms of the spelling for Kagura, the art form, the ka comes from kami, meaning God, and the gura comes from raku, meaning entertainment or pleasure. So Kagura, that way, is literally entertainment for the gods. But because, you know, kanji work in strange and mysterious ways, you can spell Kagura with a lot of different other kanji. So it would depend on the spelling, I guess. But in terms of the art form, it literally means entertainment for the gods. All right. Thanks for that last question. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, please reach out.